there is a really subtle sort of totalizing kind of um, dynamic that goes to the university now where you don't have space to disagree. Mm. You don't, wow. you don't have like, and if you disagree, you need to keep it completely quiet. You cannot show it because you cannot pass. You cannot graduate. You cannot get the job. You cannot get, you're, you're excluded from all of these things. If you show difference. Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard and I've got a guest today, uh, Dr. Ben Merkel. He's uh, president of New St. Andrews College in Idaho. He's a husband, he's a father, um, went to Oxford and uh, we're going to talk about education, uh, Christianity just in general and how to interact with the world and a bunch of other fun things. So welcome to the show, Ben Merkel. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for thanks for being here. Um First of all, uh, why don't you just give a little bit, kind of introduce yourself. I'm sure some people know who you are. Some people probably don't. Um, who are you and uh, why are you in Moscow, Idaho? <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm currently serving as a president of New St. Andrews College in Moscow, Idaho. I've been president for six years, but I started teaching here, I think, around 99. So I've been here for a while. I also am a pastor. I preach at our downtown service and been the elder of our church for a number of years as well. Um, I'm uh, my my wife, uh, Becca, and I have five kids, um, four of whom are actually currently students at NSA. One is a grad student, three is undergrad students, and then we got one more at Logos where my wife's a teacher. Um, okay. My probably interesting fact. So uh, Doug Wilson is my father-in-law. My wife is uh, his oldest daughter. And it's a little bit of why I'm here and how I got here. I, um, I'm born and raised in Boise, um, came up to the University of Idaho. So Moscow is the home of the University of Idaho. I came here uh, in 91. I was a uh, uh, reservist in the Marine Corps, driving tanks on the weekends and uh, going to college uh, during the weeks. Um, was uh, actually my degree was chemistry with uh, education or education degree with a chemistry major. Um, and the reason I was chemistry was because I thought all real knowledge was numbers and um, mm. liberal arts was for people who were just making things up. And so I was. <laughs> math science guy um and um and 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 part of that is um there's a little bit of my sort of faith story in that as well i came up here as a evangelical kid but um kind of typical evangelical kid away at college where um i, don't, I wasn't living as faithfully uh to what i knew to be the truth when i got here and then um, through a campus crusade bible study became very um convicted of my need to be um to live faithfully and probably the leading sin that I needed to mortify was that I was just a really, really lazy person and I was failing all of my classes. And um, chemistry was the class that was most kicking my rear. So I decided that if I really wanted to be a godly man, I had to start actually studying and doing well. So uh, I was um, giving myself to uh, basically every single chemistry class I could find and before I knew it, I was a chemistry major, but I really wanted to go into ministry. So uh, I became a, I did chemistry education because every pastor I knew was also a teacher. So I um, got my chemistry education degree and um, I, uh, anyhow, so, so I end up with this uh, chemistry education degree, but I really went into ministry. I started as a campus evangelist up at the University of okay. Idaho and um and uh began pastoral ministry and whatnot but it was while i was doing that ministry that i kind of rediscovered the the liberal arts and understood that they actually um had profound potential for unlocking you know the heart and the mind and and basically the the the, the sort of shortened version of that story is i as an evangelist was finding that in my um teaching and working through the college, I was having more ability to access the hearts and souls of the students than I was in a lot of my evangelistic ministry. And 
Um, and it was really in, in the world of liberal arts that that started to happen. I got a master's in English lit at the University of Idaho at that time. And then mm. uh, and then decided that I really wanted to be a full time teacher rather than a pastor. And so did the master's degree at Oxford in Jewish studies and then a doctorate there as well. Um, came yeah. back and, and still bounced between being a teacher um, and a pastor. And I, I guess I still do that now, but um, but I'm more administration at the college. OK, no, that's great. Uh, so you went to Oxford, like the Oxford. You didn't go to like some knockoff version of Oxford, right? Like, <laughs> so like a Christian can actually go to Oxford and actually do well and and achieve. Um, it's, you I mean, Oxford's like one of the biggest schools like in the world. I mean, it's like the most renowned. It's like a thousand years old. Like it's it's amazing. Yeah, it's it, it's it's uh, it's a surreal experience. That's for sure. Um, and you can be a little bit lonely as a Christian, but there is a pretty vibrant evangelical community there. Actually, yeah. my Hebrew teacher um, at Oxford that first year is now directly across the hall from me here. We hired him. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, That's but good. It, Oxford is surreal. I mean, I, I would say I don't recommend it for an undergraduate if you're a Christian. I think that mm. if I had gone there as an 18-year-old boy, I would have been destroyed by it. Um, but wow. I went there as uh, already an elder in my church, a married man with five kids, I had a little more weight behind me and I think I, we were able to really thrive there, but um, it's a, it's a very overwhelming kind of place. Yeah. No, I can imagine. Yeah. I, I uh, in seminary, we had, a, there's an undergraduate at Southern uh, boys college and uh, I assisted a guy for a few years who also went to, who also went to Oxford and yeah, he kind okay. of the same experience. I think yeah. he had three, three, three or four children when they were there too. So. Yeah. Um, no, that's good. So you, so you say you've been the president for six years and you also serve in one of the campuses at Christ church there in, um, yeah. in Moscow. Is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, how many campuses are there there? I thought there was just well, one. There's, there's, that's not... there's two locations, but four services. So there's two services at each location. And I, I preached the gotcha. first service of our downtown location. Oh, okay. Oh, so there's different guys will preach. At, yeah, at different services. Oh, he preaches the yeah. second service. Okay. Wow. Well, that's cool. I didn't know you guys did that. That's great. Um, so secondly, just regarding education, obviously um, we're told by the world we're supposed to do it. You know, some people want college education for free, right? Some people want to take out massive loans and they expect a big job coming out and they don't get it and then they get mad or, you know, they go move back with mom and dad. Um but not all jobs require a college education, right? You'd be a mechanic or even, you know, anything, right? You can artists, all sorts of different things. What would you say to someone or just people in general, people watching maybe who have children uh, who are, you know, 10, 12, 14, or maybe somebody who's thinking about college themselves should, is, is just kind of a carte blanche, everybody should go to college or you should go to a Christian college or kind of flesh that out a little bit. Is it, is it better to go to like a secular college maybe for undergrad and really get your feet wet and your, you know, get your teeth in the game and then maybe do some seminary or master's level stuff at, yeah. uh, at a different place? What, what do you think about that? Well, so I'm, I'm always really reluctant to draw these kind of like across the board. Here's the, what everybody ought to do, because, you know, as I encounter people and you start hearing their specific story, you just think, okay, there's just not a one size fits all solution. Sure. Um, I do think that college, the college industry is, um, has really over leveraged its, um, its worth or what the return on the degree is. So over the last 50 years, 50 to 70 years, we've, we've had a fairly massive transformation in our understanding is what is the purpose of education? Um, uh, education used to be a much more well-rounded uh, formation of the person um, equipping them for vocation, but also equipping them for civil service, equipping them to be leaders in their church and to be able to serve within their family and also just equipping them to be good people in general. Mm -hmm. um, all of that has been um, supplanted by this one notion that the purpose of a college degree is really to get you a job. Uh, so we really we renamed all of our college degrees to make it sound like if you want that job, you get this degree and this degree gets you that job. 
Um, and it's a really just blinkered way of thinking. And once you get into the industry, you realize it's just not true. You, you really don't mm. need that piece of paper to get this job. Um, being a good employee is far more than just having that cert- certification. Colleges on their end, they like to make, I think they like to sell that idea because if I can say that this degree gets you that job, then what I can do is I can take the projected salary of that job and I can come back and describe that as the the ROI, the return on investment for your tuition price, which we're gonna take out massive student loans in order to do. So the only reason I can make you feel like it's responsible for you to go into an obscene amount of debt is to tell you, oh, but that debt will will make sense because you're going to get this ROI because you'll get this salary. The truth is um, you just can't link those things that easily, at least in most instances. Um, so all, all that is to say, no, I don't think a college degree is um, is the the assumed next step for every kid coming out of high school. I think it's a very, very useful thing, but I think you have to get a lot more particular on what it is that you want to make sure that you're making a smart decision. And I do think that there are a lot of kids who really should not go to college. It's not the thing they need. They need to go out and and get get their hands dirty and get straight to work. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that... um, and I, and I know that people are kind of surprised that, like, you know, you're a college president. You shouldn't tell people they don't need to go to college. But <laughs> I, I, really, I really mean it as a um, there's a there's a purge that we need to do within college because we've gotten very off mission. And the previous mission was such a better mission. Like um, when we're when we're giving um, the kind of education that digs down into the soul and really equips this person to be a better person for life in jobs, but also in a whole host of other areas, that is a sweet spot that we do really, really well at, and we're equipped Mm -hmm. to be excellent at. We can really deliver a fantastic product. When we're about vocational certification, more often than not, college professors are not that well equipped to um, get you ready for the industry. When you go, I mean, everybody knows that your first day on the job is when you started learning how to do the job that that you've been employed to do and that most of what they taught you in college did not apply and was taught by people who are so out of um, connection to the industry that they they don't know what they're talking about. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know a lot of guys in computer engineering departments who, who will say, look, I would rather train the guy to program for me than get a, a um, computer science major because those guys, I have to like deprogram them and then start, mm-hmm. whereas wow. other guys, I can teach them the right way. I, I hear that again and again. And so I think we're better off as a school focusing more on these sort of core skills of critical thinking, self-motivation, being responsible, being creative, being able to work independently, being able to work on a team, being able to digest large amounts of information, being a persuasive and clear communicator, and then let the industry shape them in the particular skills that they need for that job. Whereas we're focusing on these these core things that I, I think are really are well um, delivered by the kind of liberal arts education that we give. No, that's and, good. And let me go back on that a little bit. Um, you said, should they go to a Christian college? Should they go to a secular college? Um, that's a really tough question. I'd say, honestly, about two thirds of our Christian colleges, and that's probably a really generous uh, fraction, but probably about two thirds of them are almost indistinguishable from the secular colleges, maybe even more dangerous than the secular colleges. Um, We're, we're really deeply compromised um, in the, in the Christian college space, which is really concerning. That said, if you can have a college education in a Christian discipleship atmosphere, you're getting one of the greatest blessings that you, you could get. I mean, it's a really fantastic and wonderful thing when you can taste that and it can equip you, for the rest of your life. Um, Some people, I think that's what we regularly deliver at New St. Andrews, but um, I know lots of people who find what I just described in the midst of a secular university and a really great church. You know, you've you've got this cadre of believers that are supporting you and you go to battle every day. I I know that that, uh, a lot of students do well. However, I would say, if you look at the attrition rate of kids going off to college, in general, um, it's pretty catastrophic. 
And one of the mistakes that I think parents make right now is that when I say something like, you know, um, sending your kids to a secular college, it's really dangerous. They're going to be how their faith attacked. Parents hear that and they interpret what I say in light of what they experienced back when they were college students. So parents today are the parents that are the same people I went to school with, you know, in the early 90s. And and we all had our faith attacked, you know, like I, I remember what that was like and how good that was for me. And, the you know, the cadre of believers that I had around me and how shaping yeah. that was. And so parents hear what I'm saying and then they they say, oh, but I know what you're talking about. I went through it and that was actually good for me. I want my kids to experience that. I would just the big warning is the, the college campus of today is not the college campus of the 90s. It is the mm-hmm. hostility to the faith is of a completely different level. And the attack is at a completely different level. The casualty rate is so much higher right now. And I don't think, I think we underestimate it. So wow. um, I'm not trying to give a one size fits all kind of answer. I do understand that there are some kids where that's just the thing that's before them, or maybe they need the kind of degree. Like, let's say if you want to go into engineering or nursing, you really do need a very specific vocational certification. Some of my <clears throat> earlier comments aren't as applicable. In, on some of those degrees. Um, yeah. And so some people are going to say, I, this is what God has called me to. I have to be at this kind of university. And, and so I understand it's not a one size fits all, but you need to do it with your eyes really open and understand you're really going into a very different kind of attack on your faith than what we all experienced, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've often said that. I mean, we, we homeschool, um, and mostly my wife. Uh, but, you know, we're from California originally and, you know, went to graduate high school in 2001. And so all through the 90s. And it was it was a small townish California, at least for me. Jenny was my wife was in Southern California. But, you know, that that was radically different than our parents 30 years earlier in high school and then 30 yeah. years before that. And so and now, you know, people and now we're finally kind of seeing parents wake up with like, wait, you're teaching my children what you're, you're talking about. You're talking about people, you know, white people being racist without actually being racist, or you're looking at people based on the color of their skin and making distinctions. And you're, you're teaching a boy can be a girl and all this like crazy stuff to like, not high school or college, but like six year olds. And it's just finally people are starting to realize, I feel like, you know, we're 20 years too late in one sense. uh, But, you know, better late than never, I suppose. But college, I'm sure is just as bad in in, in other areas. I mean, I went to a secular college, um, although I wasn't a believer uh, at the time, I came to faith right out of college. So I didn't struggle with it as much, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, I can only imagine how, how it, radically different that college is even now. And a lot of it is like, so, so you've got the, like the tenets uh, that are, that are being pushed on us. Um, critical race theory or, um, you know, understanding of marriage or understanding of gender, you know, so, so you've got the content that is being pushed, but that's not even the most, um, that's not even the biggest change. I think the biggest change is the way when I was a student, um, there was a, um, you know, they would, they would say something that was ridiculous. And as a Christian, I would feel like I need to stand up for the faith and I would push back against it. And it would, there, there's kind of moment where the, you know, the, the room goes quiet. They realize that you just argued with the professor and, and, and everything. But at that time, it took some courage, but there was space to do that. Like mm-hmm. I, could, I could still, I could still graduate. I could still pass the class. I could still hold a job. I could still get the positions that I wanted. I might not have as many friends. I might not go to the parties, but, but, but I could, I could hold what I held and be in the university. There is a really subtle sort of totalizing kind of um, dynamic that goes to the university now where you don't have space to disagree. Mm. You don't, wow. you don't have like, and if you disagree, you need to keep it completely quiet. You cannot show it because you cannot pass. You cannot graduate. You cannot get the job. You cannot get, you're, you're excluded from all of these things if you show difference. And so one of the things that I, the image I, that conjure up a lot of times when I think about the way, um, the university is working right now and is you imagine like there's this kind of um, worrying machine and, and the worrying machine is sort of like human society. And it's particular, it's the economy. 
And parents now think that their job is to take their child and, and give them the kind of education that, that sort of sculpts them into the perfect gear. And then if they offer the, that gear to the machine, and if they've done the right things with the education, got them the right kind of job, uh, right kind of degree and whatnot, internships and everything, and they hand it to the, the machine, if they've done it well, the machine will accept the gear, and then the gear gets to whir within the machine and everything runs swimmingly. But if wow. they've done it wrong and they get them like a degree in, say, you know, philosophy or something like that, and they hand it to the machine, then it, the machine shoots it out and you have to be a barista for life. You know, you'll never have you'll never be accepted. You'll never be whatever. Yeah. Well, we've done that with vocations and with degrees. But what the university does has done is attached to that also all the right political ideologies. So you need to have the right degree, but you also need to make sure that you have a trans, you know, um, pin and you need to have, um, you know, a BLM pin and you need to be wearing your mask at all times and in all places. And, you know, and um, th there are all these like sort of badges of ideology that you also have to adopt. And they've attached those to you being accepted by the machine. And, yeah. um, I think that as Christians, we really need to learn to not give a rip about the machine. And, um, and it's, not that, it's not that we don't want to get a job. I want to work. I want my kids to be trained to work and to be employed and to be really faithful laborers. But I want them to be laborers for God's approval and not for this machine's approval. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Um, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. I mean, it, and that really is kind of a almost a... Well, I mean, it's an egalitarian sort of um, mechanism, right? Just everybody's the same, you know, and we see this playing out with transgender stuff where, you know, boys can be girls, girls can be boys or any other mm -hmm. flavor of 72 or whatever genders there are, uh, supposedly. That's good. Um, so then I guess one thing regarding Christian education then, um, because I agree, I think a lot of Christian colleges can be just as dangerous because uh, you go in, I mean, seminaries as well, and and, you know, we could get into it. We don't have to. But, you know, there's stuff even at my seminary that's like, uh, what are we doing here? You know, we fought this 30 years ago with the conservative resurgence in the Southern Baptist Convention. And, you know, people saying they're teaching about liberal theology and teaching about, you know, Jesus not actually being God or teaching about, you know, well, these people believe that the virgin birth wasn't really essential. And yet what they were really doing is actually teaching it. Well, a lot of people, seminaries and colleges are, teaching about critical race theory and teaching about intersectionality. You're like, this is the same rhetoric the liberals so-called, yeah. you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago were doing, and we all fought it and won. And, you know, and it's just like, but what's my question, what should parents or even just, you know, a 19 year old saying, Hey, this was a good Christian college 20 years ago, or this is a good, this guy's attached to this, or these people are attached to this, or this is part of my denomination. What should they look for though? Uh, when they go to like a preview day or even checking out the website or maybe looking at when they show up there and they ask questions, what are some questions they should ask the administration or the teachers um, yeah, that's, in, in that's to try and figure good. out? It's a good question. It may be something that we need to like write a little how to manual, like how to how to visit a school. Um, yeah. I, I would say, um, first of all, I really highly recommend recommend actually spending some time at the school, get boots on the ground and see it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a college president. We spent a lot of time on the road talking about our colleges and it's, it's, you know, you can sit and you can sit and say it's all kinds of things until yeah. somebody shows up and sees um, is what you said, what's actually happening here. Um, so the webpage, the brochures and the recruiting, um, you know, recruiting officers they're useful for getting you oriented but you really need to get there and see what's going on um i would some some things that i think are real indicators first of all i would um if the college has a chapel series um usually those talks are online somewhere or recorded or at the very least you can see the names and whatnot and i would just go back and look over mm -hmm. the last couple of years and see what what were they promoting there? And and is this faithful? Okay. Are they Chapel. Really like confronting the direction the world is going or are they indulging it? I think that's usually mm -hmm. one real telling thing. Um, I would say um, the other would be I would want to talk to students, 
not just faculty and administration, but I would actually want to talk to students and ask them um, if, uh, you know, if a student, um, let's say a student comes out uh, and announces uh, they're transgender or something like that, um, has that happened and what has been the response of the administration? Um, how, how would that sort of thing be handled? Um, does is there a, is that addressed in the statement of faith and do they actually do something about it when it happens? Mm. Uh, I, that's a really tough thing to address now and it takes a lot of courage to draw a line and actually defend it. And colleges that will do that are, are increasingly rare. I think what you'll tend to find is a lot of, um, yeah, a, a, a lot of things just kind of quietly um, suppressed or more common. What you have is um, the college is portrayed one way online, but it's a very different way um, when you get there in person. Yeah. In reality. Okay. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, so for, you kind of touched on this a little bit, what are besides, I don't know, I was looking at like maybe the last hundred years or even 50, but you kind of touched on it a bit, but maybe flesh it out a little more. What are the other things? I mean, again, college has changed a lot. We've kind of switched from a very, very particular thing, like you said, with the gear and, and you just need to be fold molded into this little gear, go into the machine and, you know, retire in 40 years or whatever. Um, what are some other things that our great grandparents, you know, who, who had gone to college, what did they experience then? And what is lacking now and in, in kind of the contrast between those two things, both either Christian college or just even just the university in general? Sure. Yeah, a few things. I mean, one would be one of the biggest ones is the financial model. Um, so over the last 50 years, the colleges have become um, really dependent on federal money. I mean, even your private colleges, um, I, I don't I'll, I won't go into all the numbers here, but even your private Christian colleges, probably get more money from the federal government than they do from parents in tuition checks. Now it's, it's wow. routed as student loans and Pell Grants. So it comes to them as a tuition payment. But when you go back and you look at the sources, the the federal government is the primary funder of them. And so um, that the way the federal government has stepped into um, funding education has first of all caused the tuition cost to go crazy high. We we charge a mm. lot more. I say we, the world of higher ed, um, and I say we yeah. actually try to behave like this. But in general, colleges um, jack up tuition to capture uh, more tuition revenue that's made available by uh, increased Pell grants and student loans. They're talking about right now doubling, this is a big push, is to double the size of the Pell Grant. Uh, you will see tuition go boom as soon as that happens. Wow. Because colleges are businesses, and the first rule of business is you don't leave money on the table. If you if you come to me yeah. to buy a car that I was going to sell for five grand, but I find out you have 10 grand in your pocket, the price just went up. And yeah. um, because of the way financial aid works, uh, when you apply to the school, we can see what your financial position is and your capacity to pay. And so wow. your capacity goes up because Pell Grants doubled or you just were cleared for this amount of student loans. Suddenly we're going to make sure we capture as much of that as possible by raising tuition or by um, by leveraging how much financial aid we give you. So you're mm -hmm. you'll get a scholarship and the scholarship is going to be determined by how much we can we think we can get out of you. Um, and so the the financial picture is is a big piece. And then the other, the other thing that's happened with that is it means that now um, federal ideology is the primary thing that needs to be appeased as a um, college administration. We need to stay in step with the federal ideology because that money is attached to whatever, you know, um, how many colleges, Christian colleges are now in the place where they have to allow men into the women's locker room because they want to keep their Pell Grants, right? Yeah, wow. Uh, so federal ideology is attached to that money, and that's really going to shape the, the direction these, these colleges go, rather than independent market forces. Like when you have a more of a free market, then that's going to favor leadership that is um, oriented towards high performance, being a little bit risky and bold, 
Um, you know, the, everybody's going this way. So you see there's an opportunity over here. You go this way. That's how businessmen succeed. Yeah. Um, but but the way colleges are funding means that that at the very top of college administration, what you're doing is you're looking for people who can demonstrate compliance because they're trying to stay as, as in the very center of the, the um, pack as they can because that's how they keep their money. So it doesn't favor innovative um, kind of thinking or or being defiant when ridiculous rules are coming down. It doesn't favor that at all. Free market would. Yeah. So the, the, fund, the funding is one big part of it. The other is, like I said, that, that change in um, what we think an education is for, you know, the whole, the whole land grant university thing um, that, um, in the 1860s and then again, the 1890s um, was sort of one of the first steps in repositioning our understanding of what higher education was for. It's really about yeah. training to be in certain industries. And then um, with the GI Bill um, post-World War II, um, and then reimagined after Vietnam, and then again the Gulf War. Um, the the GI Bill again said federal money is going to pay for all these people going to school, so we want certain deliverables, and it got oriented towards vocational certification. Yeah. Um, so that that shift to college is about vocational certification. I think that's one of the the biggest changes. And then the way that um, has been attached to federal um, agendas um, has really changed what education is about. And I think that the church has not had its eye open to what's going on there. Yeah. Wow. So I guess that would be one thing then, too, to look at from some schools who maybe don't take what is it, Title IX or whatever, you know, federal funding. I know there are some schools that Christian colleges and others. I know even Hillsdale that isn't that's up in Michigan, not necessarily a Christian college, but I know they're historic kind of American Christian kind of yeah, base, yeah. but I don't think they take any federal funding money at all, which I think is a really good thing. Yeah. Hill, Hillsdale Grove city are the two probably biggest colleges that people know for not taking the federal money. Um, and then you go like one tier down in size and then you start hitting like um, Patrick Henry in Virginia um, NSA here um and then and then there are are other a, a few smaller ones um yeah we're small but there are smaller um that that would be in that category as well but it's it's not a big crop but i think it's probably about to grow because i think uh, under okay. the biden administration we're seeing a lot of um we're going to see a lot of unfavorable um, movement within the Department of Education, unfavorable to people with our um, convictions. Yeah. Well, and I think that's probably a good thing, ultimately. I mean, because you're kind of exposing a lot of just the craziness that's been been going on for probably decades, but you don't really see it until all of a sudden, you know, you have all that mold behind the wall, you tear back the wall, you're like, there's a little mold, then you tear it back, and you're like, oh my goodness, it's an infestation. So, um. No, that's good. So I guess, you know, parents need to give more money to Christian colleges, right? Yeah, like NSA and others. Yeah, this whole thing <laughs> um, is just a donor pitch. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Give to NSA. No, not National Spying Agency, by the way. I always hear NSA and I'm always like, not the government that always Edward Snowden yeah. and all that. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I have a baseball hat with uh, NSA on it and I was wearing it when I was on a trip to DC and I suddenly realized this is really has a different connotation here than it has. Really here. Good. And I think that <laughs> the other thing was probably that people who are in the NSA don't put it on their ball cap and walk around with it. But Right. You're like, I can see your phone right now. No. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe the last question we can kind of wrap up is um, for, again, parents and students, but probably more particular parents, parents like young parents like me. I mean, our oldest is only 11. Um, but say, you know, I, I would say, Get out of government schools. That's just me. Uh, yeah. But say you can't or whatever, or or say you're homeschooling, but you still, I mean, truthfully, you know, homeschools, it's a struggle for us. And we don't really do much of a co-op because it just doesn't really exist. And it right. could be more rich. Uh, but of course, there's finances with private school and so on. So say the parents that want to educate their children and want to do well, but they don't have like the blessing of, of, a, of a liberal arts uh, 
undergrad or uh, you know K through twelve sort of thing, kind of like Logos is. What can we do as, as parents, as mothers and fathers, tr to train our children, whether and not just curriculum, but just in general, to kind of what as a as a college president. Um, looking at students, which obviously you've got many and seen many, what would you like to see and what can parents do for, you know, their 10 and 12 and 14 year olds? Um, whether it's, you know, what type of curriculum, but also just kind of life stuff, you know, whether you're homeschooling or, Hey, you, you still got a kids at public school. We still want to be a light for Jesus. Okay. That's your conviction. Fine. I would disagree, but that's fine. But we got to do more, right? We always can do more. What can we do? And what would you like to see for them to succeed at a place like NSA? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, um, you know, again, that, that the fact that like, I know that I'm speaking to people with just a whole variety of circumstances and there, there are the occasional people who are in these really impossible situations where they can't, they don't have the access to the school that you really think they ought to be in or whatever. And I, I do think it's important that you, you, you know, that, the most important thing is, is love that, that, um, you know, the law is love. And if you are loving, um, then you are doing what God is asking you to do. And there are some people where all other normal means of being able to raise their kids or strip from them, but be obedient to love and God is faithful. That said, I would say that far too often people are, um, making excuses that they shouldn't make with regard mm. to changing their kids on the education that they really ought to be giving them. Uh, we come up with a lot of reasons to not pull our kids out of the public schools that I think are more excuses than real legitimate reasons. And and I can say that because I've, I've started with a qualifier. I understand that there are the occasional, just really you're in a difficult position and I, I don't want to fall. I don't want to heap condemnation on that person because I know that God is faithful in those situations. If you're mm -hmm. loving God will bless it. But a lot of people, the reason they're not taking their kids out of the government school is because it would actually just cut into their entertainment budget. It would cut mm. into their uh, time. They would have to downsize their house. They would have to, um, you know, they would have to make sacrifices that they're not ready to make in order mm. to give the education they should. And I could just say that, like, um, it is, I just see that play out again and again. And it's just such a tragedy to see parents who do love God, but they've not made those sacrifices to raise their kids faithfully. And they raise kids who do not love God. Um, mm. They've, they've put them through that public school. And, um, and in general, I think the American church is suffering because we as a church have not made the hard decisions. Um, we, um, you know, as you saw that trans video that came out not too long ago, they claim our children. They believe that the kids belong to them and if you look at the track record yeah. through the public school system it's true they we we give our kids to them and look at the yeah. political ideology of every single teacher at the school that you're sending your kids to be discipled by and and again this is where um that transformation in in what we think education is is really um, important because we think education is supposedly just job training so it's not a big deal if my kid goes and learns math from that person education is formative of the whole person and they're being discipled to be a certain kind of person in that school. So it's just yeah. a really big deal. Um, until the church recovers education, we're going to keep losing ground. Um, the, the Christian faith is a generational faith. Um, the gospel, whenever it's preached, it's always for you and for your children. You're supposed to receive it and then you're supposed to pass it on to your kids. And that requires hard work. I uh, reading recently in, uh, 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 as an academic uh, work about the doctrine of um, baptism in Calvin's Geneva. And one of the things that was noted was when, when you said amen at the baptism of that baby, what you were committing to as a congregation is that we're going to fund that kid's Christian education. And mm -hmm. it, you were committing to more than that, sure. but that was implicit in that amen was we as a group are going to make sure that you're funded. So I would say sacrifice for your kids. If you don't have kids, figure out the local Christian school that is being faithful and give to them and support them. You you mm -hmm. want this to be passed on. If there are homeschooling parents that need assistance, uh, you know, support in their co-op, if you can volunteer to teach a class, that's, that's just so um, important and informative. So I would say 
commit to that K to 12 Christian education. Um, and when people have worked on that, um, at our, when I get kids who have been raised that way, what we're able to do, with that, what we're able to build on that is so much more. Um, the, you know, the skills that we really need to see when kids come in are um, that they, a big one is just being able to read, you know, that can, okay. they, can they, can they write, um, can they, can they read, can they write? Another one is, can they argue? Um, and I don't mean just like, are they sharp, like with the rules of argument, but a lot of kids just get emotionally rattled when disagree mm. pops up. And, um, and that's not, I, that's, that's our flesh. And we need to learn how to be the kind of people who are unthreatened um, by that. I still, one of my favorite moments I remember at Oxford was I was, I was in this Hebrew class and the guy who's teaching the class is the Oxford chair of Hebrew. I mean, it's an appointment that's been around since like Henry the eighth. So it's a big deal. <laughs> and I'm in the, and we're and the, and he made some argument. I think it was about Psalm 23. He said something and I just disagreed with it. And I started to, I started to object to it. And then I realized, Ooh, that's, you know, don't do that to him. And I yeah. started to pull back and I remember him leaning forward and going, Oh, come on. Like, like, like this, like, like he, he really wanted me to argue. And that impulse, like it's something that a really rigorous education pulls out of you. It makes you say you're unfazed by argument, but I think yeah. a lot of kids are, it's one of the things I like about the classical method is it trains argumentation and gets the kids comfortable with that, which I think you know, our safe space kind of snowflake education really dislikes that kind of argument, but I think it's really, really good to inculcate. And then, and then for us, I yeah. mean, very, very, the biggest thing, the most important thing is that you've just taught them to love God. Like kids, kids who come here, they love God. They love his world. They're interested. They're excited about everything that we're doing and they're just fun to teach. But the kids who are here, yeah because this is just what they're supposed to do. They have to get a college degree. They've always answered with their pat religious answers, you know, God, Jesus, Bible, and they, they just know to say the right thing. Those kids um, can't really learn that much and they're no fun to teach, but teach them to just love. Mm. God. It's just really, really one of the greatest sort of pedagogical strengths. Yeah, no, that's good. So reading, writing, don't get rattled when you're arguing and um, love God. That's good. No, I mean, and that's, and it's so basic. And, but I mean, it's, it's also at the same time revolutionary because you have people who, you know, say math is racist and boys can be girls and up is down and so on. So a lot of times going back to just standard basic traditional stuff is like, well, that's, that's what we should have been doing all along. And somehow we got off the rails. Let's get back to it. So no, that's good. That's really, really helpful. Um, yeah. Well, anything else, anything else you want to add any pitches or thoughts or are you working on any writing right now or projects you guys are doing at NSA or uh, we're working on, wanna... actually, I'm working right now on a, um, a podcast. We'll start where I'm going through um, great works with different faculty members. Um, so oh, cool. I'm about to do one on Herodotus with Chris Schlecht and then uh, a little bit of mere Christianity with Doug Wilson. And so hopefully that'll be a podcast series that will come out. I think, on the Canon app is my guess. I'm not positive where it's going to go. Okay, um, cool. But yeah, I've been I've been doing my Herodotus reading all morning to be uh, ready to not be stupid. Um, hopefully, <laughs> I've never read, uh, but I, I should. I'm sure. It's I've really I've kind of I hated reading as a kid, and now I love it. And now I have I feel like I'm always behind because I've there's all these books that I've never read, and it's like I need to read these books at some point. But yeah. time will tell. So. No, that's good. Um, yeah, the Canon app, by the way, that's I've been using that for the last however many months. It's a great. I would definitely tell that to anybody. I mean, you got to pay for it each month, but I think what is it? Seven yeah, bucks, got, or eight bucks. I, I mean, it, content on there as we can. A bunch of NSA stuff. I think it's a great platform for everybody. And I kind of, I kind of suspect that we're not going to be welcome on other platforms for very much longer. So, yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> but that's that's okay. That happens. I remember. Uh, Doug said something about it was a few months ago something about how he phrased it because you know he how he's just got such a poetic way to talk but 
it was like, there'll be servers in the catacombs. <laughs> it's just like, you know, so we're hiding, you know, but we've still got servers. So we're still producing content. You can still access it easily uh, yeah. online. So it's definitely good. But no, I, I appreciate this conversation. This, I, thank, you, thank you for taking time out of your day and uh, just talking about these, these issues. These are really, really good. So uh, maybe we can talk again at some point and definitely keep up with NSA. Where, where can people find you, by the way? Um, well, just nsa.edu is the is the web page actually we're about to overhaul it right now it's it's in, in need of a, a little bit of refreshing okay. I, I i don't i don't do much social media i'm trying to be a better person we'll see if i can start putting more out but yeah i do you have like a blog or anything else like that youtube or no, I, I spotify anything like that extremely untended so okay Fa you said facebook page yeah okay no, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I can I can barely do YouTube. I don't actually do anything else. So okay. time time does not allow. So anyway, again, I appreciate the conversation. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, until next time. Thanks for much. having me. All right. Yeah. Thanks, man. Bye. All right, I hope you enjoyed that talk with Dr. Merkel. Um, he's a very insightful, very humble man, and uh, he's done a lot of work. He's not as uh, prolific, as he said, on uh, social media as some others, but he can be found there at uh, New St. Andrew's uh, website. And uh, he's also with Douglas Wilson and, and that church and uh, those ministries that they do. So you can find him uh, with interviews and blogs and podcasts and so on as well. So uh, I'm sorry if it, if it was not the best sound. Um, I'm at the office and the internet here isn't always very good. So if you made it all the way to this point, I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll try and get a little bit better connection and figure out a, a better method next time. But I think sometimes it froze um, and it might have dropped out audio wise sometimes. So kind of sound like um, a transformer, or, you know, Meg Megatron or something. So anyway, I uh, hope you all are well. And uh, like I said, please uh, comment below. Um, please comment below and uh, let me know your thoughts. I'd really appreciate it. All right. Take care.